Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening and uh, good morning. Good afternoon for some of you. Thank you uh, so much for coming tonight, uh, today. Um, so welcome uh, to today's panel. Um, and let me just begin by saying that we are interested in hearing from you if you have a work in progress and you would like to present uh, your work in progress at a JPOS session. Uh, so please do be in touch, uh, submit your proposal uh, at the website. And if you're not on the list to serve and you're not getting our emails, then please sign up. Uh, the information is on this page and it's a fairly easy website, jpos.org. So today is our 52nd session of JPOS and we are really excited to have a session on the elections where um, it's going to be, it's called Japan Decides 2024, um, a preliminary analysis of the Japanese general election that I'm sure we've all been watching. We watched very closely a few weeks ago. Um, okay, so we have three presenters this evening. First, we have Professor Kenneth Mori McElwain uh, from the University of Tokyo. Kenneth is a visiting scholar this year at Columbia University, a visiting professor. And we're also delighted to hear from Professor Paul Maeda, uh, Associate Professor at the University of North Texas. And we're welcoming Tetsuya Matsubayashi from Osaka Daigaku, and he's coming uh, to us today from Japan. So we're very excited to have him as well. And yes, that's me. Um, so we've got, uh, please remember for uh, some etiquette for the JPOS uh, sessions. So please remember to keep your microphone muted during the presentation and uh, the discussant comments, uh, just the presentations today. Um, let me note that today's session, we're going to record this session and we're going to be posting the recording online. So it's a little bit different from the other sessions in that usually we just give the recording only to the speakers, but today we're going to make it publicly available so people who are interested in what we all have to say about the election, what we think about the election, uh, can access this recording. So as always, please submit questions and comments in chat. Um, you're also very, very welcome to raise your hand by clicking the raise hand function, and then I will call on you um, when, when we're in the Q&A. So you can either do chat or raise your hand. And please, everybody, respect the privacy of other people in the gallery view by refraining from the use of unauthorized video, photo, or audio recordings. So without further ado, I think we're going to start uh, tonight with Kenneth. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you so much to the JPOS team, um, particularly Shin Fujihira, for putting this together. Um, I'm really speaking on behalf of uh, uh, two other co-editors of Japan Decides 2024, Robert Pekinen at the University of Washington and Dan Smith at the University of Pennsylvania. I think this election, um, well, we're all election experts, so I think we find every election interesting. Um, but I think what was uh, surprising about this contest was one, the fact that there was a government turnover, but two, a turnover at a time when um, the, the passion or what's often called the winds of the election um, were very unclear at first. Um, is it that the LDP, that the opposition parties won? Is it that the L LDP lost through own goals? Um, I think there are a large number of questions that I think all of us um, are interested in exploring and understanding a little bit better. And um, this is actually my first time serving as a co-editor of Japan Decides, um, but the, the series itself has been around since 2012, um, published through Palgrave Macmillan, um, with um, past editors, including Stephen Reed, as well as Ethan Shiner. Um, and so this uh, Japan Decides 24, 24, it's my pleasure to do this with Robert and Dan. Um, I, I just wanna show you a tentative lineup of the chapters that we have in mind. Um, the structure of the volume will look quite similar to past volumes, we will of course have an introduction that explores what happened to Japanese politics since the last contest, um, explorations of a party politics, specifically the performance and strategies of key parties in the election, Kuni Nemoto on the LDP, um, Fumi Ikeda on the CDP and the left, um, Axel Klein, Levi McLaughlin on Kometo, and um, uh, Masahiro Zenkyo from Kwansei Gakuin on uh, uh, Nippon Ishin no Kai, Japan Innovation Party. And then we have a series of chapters that look at uh, the campaign itself and the election outcome. And um, by the way, I should know one, one um, change that we made in the lineup this year is that we consciously um, tried to bring in 
a broader uh, selection of authors um, from the United States, of course, but also from Japan. And one new contributing team is the University of Tokyo Asahi survey team, the UTAS team um, from with uh, Masaki Taniguchi, Takaki Asano, Shoko Omori, and Shusuke Takamiya talking about candidate profiles and positions, and also um, the the sort of the, uh, the the Japan micro level survey team um, led by Tetsuya Matsubayashi at um, Osaka University Institute of uh, Public Policy, um, public opinion analysis by Yukio Maeda, um, social media, which um, I think to some extent Japan Japanese elections were a little bit insulated from for a while, but I think it's playing a much more central role, will be analyzed by Rob Fahi at Waseda, um, Tomoko Matsumoto writing on party manifestos, and Michio Umeda doing a little bit of the TikTok of how the campaign itself unfolded. And finally, we have a fourth section that looks at concrete issues. There were a lot of things that happened since 2021. Um, Levy McLaughlin will be writing about the Unification Church scandal. Uh, Matt Carlson from Vermont will be writing about uh, more the financial scandals, the political corruption scandals that beset the LDP. Um, we have a couple of chapters on trade and the economy that we're still negotiating. We're pleased to have Kristen Bakazi writing about um, trade and economic security, specifically uh, Yuki Tsuji um, from Tokai Daigaku on gender, uh, Kazuyoshi Kawasaka on LGBTQ plus issues. Um, Reiko Arami from Nagaya, Nagoya on childcare and Takako Hikotani on foreign policy and hopefully an additional chapter on monetary policy and inflation. And today um, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, Amy already did the introductions, uh, but Ko Maeda from North Texas and Tetsuya Matsubayashi from Osaka. And so I'd like to turn it over to them. Um, and uh, Ko, I think you're up first. So let me hand things over to you. Okay, um, so I'm, I think the screen share worked. Yep, it's working. All right, uh, great. Uh, thank you. I'm Ko Maeda. Uh, so I will be writing a chapter on the overall election results uh, in this uh, volume as I did for the previous one. So I have been processing lots of numbers in the last few weeks, and I'm going to show some findings uh, today. So just quickly, first, what happened? Um, so October 27th general election, as we all know, uh, the the coalition coalition lost lo a lot. The total seat share uh, fell from 63 percent three years ago to 46.2 percent. So that's, that is a big uh, decline. So apparently, uh, pri new prime minister Ishiba was hoping to do what his predecessor Kishida did three years ago. That is to call an early election shortly after taking office while his popularity was still high and win the election. But uh, that didn't happen. So um, according to exit polls, uh, looks like the financial scandal from last year that involved many LDP politicians uh, hurt uh, the LDP in this election. So, okay. Total 12 independent candidates were elected and six of them are pro-LDP independent uh, politicians. So uh, the government can count on their votes in most occasions, I believe, but still, even after including them, the government is 12 seats short of the simple majority of 233 seats. And as a result, Ishiba's new cabinet uh, took office without controlling a majority. The approval rating 28.7%, um, according to the most recent GG survey, which is much better than Kishida's ratings this past year. But still, um, for a new prime minister, this is quite uh, low. So um, a minority cabinet is very unusual, uh, rare in Japan. And so the probably the government will have to concede a lot to one or more opposition parties uh, to pass any legislation. The government wants to pass a new supplementary budget in the coming weeks. And of course, the new budget for the new fiscal year has to be passed by the end of March. And then the true test, true test will be in July, uh, the upper house election. This is so important for 
Kishiba, Kish, Kishida, and, and、uh, Ishiba, LDP. And also for opposition parties, this will be extremely important because many, many single member districts, opposition parties will have to make a choice about whether to coordinate candidate nomination or not. This, this will be very interesting to watch. So now let's look at、uh, the overall、uh, results. The top two bars are for the SMD、uh, seat shares for this election and the last election. And of course, the, <clears throat> the LDP lost a lot. And the big, big winner is the largest opposition CDP. And two centrist or center right parties, DPP and Ishin, they. <clears throat> Yes,、uh, they also increased、uh, the SMD seats. And as we all know,、um, in SMD elections, a drastic change in seat share happens because the magnitude of a vote share,、uh, vote swing is magnified in the seat results. <clears throat> the bottom two bars are for the PR vote share.、Uh, the LDP lost a lot, and CDP almost stayed the same. Ishin lost, and the clear winner was the DPP.、Uh, it more than doubled its PR vote share. The DPP appealed to working age voters with economic policies targeted toward them, and apparently、uh, it worked. An exit poll shows that DPP won more votes than the CDP among younger respondents under the age 40. Now, let me talk about the,、uh, the SMD tier more in detail. After that, I will talk more about the PR、uh, tier in detail. So, in the, last, in the last election, three years ago, the CDP, Communist, Social Democrats, and Leiwa Shinsengumi、uh, coordinated their candidate nominations, trying to avoid splitting votes and fall together. But this time, This time,、uh, there was no national level effort to do so, and opposition parties、uh, nominated candidates more or less independently. As a result, <clears throat> the number of opposition candidates increased significantly. For the total 289 districts, 653 opposition candidates ran, and the communists ran more than twice as many candidates、uh, this time compared to the last election. That Should have given an advantage to the LDP c o m e t o coalition. But the opposition parties won, <clears throat>、uh, the opposition parties more, won more districts than the coalition in this election. Hypothetically,、uh, if <clears throat> the opposition parties had coordinated candidate nominations, they might have won more seats. So the LDP c o m e t o Okay, they lost many close races.、Uh, usually, they win many of the competitive districts, but not this time. So,、uh, okay, so looking at the districts that were decided with less than three percentage point margins, the last election,、uh, the coalition won more, a majority of them, but this time the opposition won majority of those close competitive、uh, districts. Okay, moving on.、Um, three years ago, in my chapter for the previous Japan Decides volume, I pointed out that the LDP candidates' winning rate, winning percentage, declined in urban districts. Kind of suddenly. Before that, in all urban, rural, middle districts, LDP candidates are winning with about 70 to 80 percent. But last time, the LDP's urban district candidate, Their percentage dropped to 50. And what happened this time? It, it declined everywhere. Declined everywhere. And in urban district, it went down even to 31%, 31%、um, uh, winning rate. <clears throat> so for the LDP to win again in the next election, they will somehow need to reverse、uh, this trend. The next Graph, I am plotting the LDP candidates who ran in both the last election and this election so that I can trace the changes in their electoral performance. The x axis shows the level of urbanization, and y axis is the vote share.
in the, in the SMDs. The change from the last election is shown in, uh, in arrows. Okay, now black arrows are the candidates, LDP candidates who lost in this election. And red are the ones who lost votes but still won the seat. And the blue are the candidates who gained votes uh, since the last election. By the way, the, the this one, the top, very top one, but this is Ish Ishiba him, himself. So, so we see lots of those black or red uh, arrows. Actually, 95% of those candidates uh, saw a decline in their vote share. So it happened everywhere, urban and rural, but uh, many urban districts were already competitive. So that's why the drop <clears throat> resulted in many defeats in, of AODP candidates. That's the story, uh, I believe. And now let's move on to the PR uh, tier. <clears throat> okay, so this graph, this graph uh, shows selected parties' uh, PR vote share uh, since two th 2003. So clearly the LDP's uh, PR vote share declined uh, this time. And it is now actually at the same level with this 2009, actually exact the same percentage. If you remember 2009, that was a truly disastrous defeat for the LDP. Now the LDP's PR vote share declined to that level, really. But, but of course, the overall electoral results for the LDP this time was, of course, not as bad. <laughs> It is it is simply because the, now we have more parties than before. So, uh, the, so okay in the in those elections from two thousand three to two thousand nine, in those years, the top two parties that which means LDP and uh, DPJ top two parties were winning about 70% of PR, PR votes combined. The top two won seven, about 70% of votes. But after that, after 2012, the top two parties combined vote share has been much lower, at most 55%. And this time it fell below 50. So clearly we have more parties. So, um, <clears throat> So while the CDP, okay, this this blue line shows both DPJ and CDP. So CDP ki kind of stable, kind of stable, but about, about 20%. That's way lower, way lower than what DPJ was winning in those years from 2003 to 2009. It, okay, we all remember 2005, Koizumi's landslide postal election. At that time, we all said, oh, DPJ lost so badly. That's devastating for them. But look at this. In that 2005 election, DPJ was still winning more than 30% of peer votes. So it's really different that time and post-2012 uh, elections. So, okay, the CDP, yeah, kind of stable. But so clearly... CDP is the is winning the majority of those left leaning votes. Yes, that's that's true. But at the same time, the CDP is losing the centrist or center left voters. This time, clearly DPP. DPP was the major winner of those votes, voters located between the LDP and CDP. And in the last election, yeah, Ishin. Ishin was the main winner of those votes. Ishin really grew in the last election. And 2017, the, at the time, the party of hope, this little dot here, <laughs> the hope won a lot from those uh, voters located in the middle. So uh, the, the for the CDP to really grow, to become a main opposition party that the, the, the DPJ was in the past, the CDP will somehow win those voters in the middle. But, 
But this time, DP, DPP, led by Tamaki, was, was so successful this time. So, of course, Tamaki and other DPP leaders, they don't want to change anything. They want to keep this momentum by keeping the current position that is to not, not work with the, with the CDP and to be independent. So uh, that means, okay, for the CDP, it is the, the future is not so bright, I guess. At the, the, there's no good news for the uh, CDP. And now this is the last graph I have uh, today. So in the chapter I wrote three years ago, I wrote, um, because Ishin grew a lot that time. I wrote, if Ishin grows further, Japan's party politics would take the form of trilateral competition. Not bilateral, but trilateral competition of three polars, one LDP, Kometo, and another CDP plus other opposition parties, and then the third is Ishin. So, and that's, we, that, that was what was happening, it seemed at the time. So this uh, right side triangular plot shows the, uh, the prefecture level PR vote shift from 2017 to 2021. So the prefectures like Osaka, uh, Hyogo, or Kyoto, those kinky area, the, <clears throat> there was a major movement toward uh, this vertex showing the more more Ishin uh, votes. So um, Ishin won a lot in many, many of those uh, prefectures. But then what happened this time, this, the other side, this uh, right side triangular plot, clearly the movement is going to the top vertex that shows more uh, CDP plus other opposition parties, but okay, this combined CDP and DPP and Reiwa, Reiwa also gained uh, votes this time. So uh, it's not <clears throat> it's not just CDP, but but uh, even in Osaka, Ishin lost PR votes compared to the last election, and <clears throat> so uh, the <clears throat> the movement is actually uh, going toward top uh, vertex and away uh, from Ishin, and of course away from uh, the LDP. Uh, and by the way, I thought it's kind of cute to see to to Totori, uh, that's where Ishiba is from. Uh, only one prefecture uh, that is showing complete the opposite di direction. Actually, the, this time, this time looking at the uh, prefecture level PR vote change, Totori was the, Totori was the only prefecture where LDP gained votes compared to the last election. All other 46 prefectures, the LDP lost uh, votes. <clears throat> so uh, the looks like the, <clears throat> at least for now, the move, the movement toward trilateral uh, party competition halted at least uh, for now. Of course, we don't know what will happen from uh, here, uh, but that's what we see uh, at this point. Thank you very much. That's great, Cor. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Matsubayashi san. Okay, so let me begin. Thank you so much for having me for this opportunity. Um, today, so as Kenneth noted, um, I think I'm supposed to look at what happened with turnout in this election. So, but I kind of switched my topic from like explaining the turnout to like talking about the relationship between turnout and the election outcomes that just co like talked about. So, so let me begin what I have done until today. So by the way, my name is Tetsuya Matsubayashi from uh, Oshi Osaka School of International Public Policy. So, so, um, so this is just what Ko already showed to us. So this is about um, party voter shares 
in proportional representation, and I just showing the change in the vote share between 2024 and 2021. And of course, uh, LDP lost by large margins, while um, DPP gained lots of it. And of course, there are some additional I mean, changes for Ishin and Reiwa. So, but I would like to, exp so of course, I mean, if you want to know what happened, so why like LDP lost or some other parties gained the vote share. So we probably come up with two like simple mechanical explanations. Um, one is simple, just people switched their choices from one party to another. So let's say LDP supporters, um, didn't vote for LDP, but chose another party, like, I don't know, DPP or Reiwa or CDP. So, but this is not what I'm going to talk about today. My focus is, of course, more on participation and abstention. So, for example, so some people decided not to vote for a particular party this election. That's why, let's say, LDP lost, or, or some people who did not vote in the last election decided to vote this time in order to support for a particular party. So I would like to look at this possibility in two different ways today. So my so there are two groups of research questions I'm going to address today. One is, of course, about LDP. So LDP lost by about seven percentage point in a proportional representation. So I am asking, so if so LDP vote share decreased because LDP supporters abstained in this election. So this is according, so this is coming from like a, some like a newspaper report saying that Jiminto Shijisha wa neteita so this is clearly a very interesting question because LDP supporters are generally politically active and that they typically vote for the party in every election. But because probably many LDP voters were not happy with the financial scandal or the cabinet or many other issues. So, but of course they don't have any like other parties they want to vote for. So they simply chose not to vote this election. So the question is this is empirically plausible or not? So this is one of the questions I'm going to address today. The other question is, uh, did LDP candidates with the funding scandal demobilize LDP supporters? This is just the related question with the first one. So again, LDP, LDP voters were very unhappy, but still there are about 40 candidates decided to run for this election. So the question is, if LDP voters have those candidates in their district, again, they decided to just stay away from this election. So I would like to know whether this was actually happening or not, um, using some data I'm going to talk about. The second set of question is focusing on DPP, because DPP um, gained about by seven percentage point in PR, and this is clearly very striking result to us. So the question is this, um, DPP's vote share increased like this because new voters, I'm defining them as those who abstained in 2021, but voted in this election. So new voters voted to support DPP. So this means that DPP could mobilize new group of people to support them or not. So this is not about a party switch. This is about a new group of people who didn't vote, but who, who wanted to vote this election. And uh, this could be partly explained by what the course suggested, like DPP could attract working age people. So potentially, so my next question is, who are these new voters? And uh, so this could be 
working age people or this could be young people in Japan. And as you already know, younger people are very politically inactive. But in this election, they were for some reason to become, became active and chose this party. Also, I'm, this is another empirical question. So I'm gonna ask, I'm sorry, I'm gonna test it. So to answer these questions, um, I decided to use uh, municipality level data. So I collected um, overall turnout and party vote shares in PR from all uh, 1900 municipalities in the last general election and this general election. So the data were obtained from um, 47 prefectural election administration commissions. And uh, this isn't an easy task for the short period of time because I mean, data were very messy. And I really want everybody, every prefecture to use the same format, but I, I mean, for some reason, some prefectures have very weird format, but um, my RA was good enough to, to clean them up in, in a week or so. So I combined them and I generally taking uh, using a change in turnout or change in party vote share in these two elections. I combined some additional variables to this municipality level data. One of them is the list of LDP candidates with the funding scandal. And I obtained those data from Kyoto Tsushin. So in total, there were uh, 46 um, LDP related candidates uh, with this funding scandal. And I also added some demographic variables from the 2020 census and Shakai Jingo Toke Taike. So let me show you some preliminary results from my analysis. So my first question was, did um, LDP supporters abstain in 2024? So I'm translating this into uh, the hypothesis like this. So I'm hypothesizing that, so higher LDB vote share in the previous election is associated with lower turnout in this election compared to 2021. So this could be interpreted as a very simple DID where municipalities with higher LDP vote share in 2021 are the treatment group because they could be more influenced by the electoral like a situation in this election year and they could be demobilized. So they are likely to show high, lower turnout. On the other hand, municipalities with lower LDP vote share in 2021 as a control. So this is more like, I'm using like a continuous, like a polytomant variable for a very simple um, two period uh, DID design. But of course, I mean, clearly this is not uh, like a typical DID analysis. So if the hypothesis I suggested is right, the slope should be negative. So let me let me show you my result. So in the horizontal on the horizontal axis, I uh, located the LDP vote share in 2021. On the vertical axis, I located the change in per overall turnout in percentage. So if LDP uh, supporters actually have many of them abstained in 2024, the slope was expected to be um, negative. But as you see, it's clearly a flat line and the slope is very small, like 0 0.01 and the T-stat is below um, one. So according to this um, result, LDP supporters did not abstain. 
So they probably voted and they probably chose another party to for their choice in 2024. So my second question was, did LDP candidates with the funding scandal demobilize LDP supporters? So to answer this question, I'm hypothesizing this. So 46 candidates with the funding scandal in 2024 will be associated with lower turnout in 2024 compared to 2021. So again, this could be interpreted as a DID. So two groups, uh, 320 municipalities with the scandal candidates are the treatment group. And other approximately, um, 15, 50 municipalities without them are the control. So, I mean, in 2021, there were no scandal candidates, but in 2024, some municipalities had them while the other municipalities did not. So if the hypothesis is true, the slope again should be negative. So here is some results. So in the first column, I only uh, include, so include, so the outcome variable, I'm sorry, uh, the outcome variable is the change in turnout measured at the municipality. In the right hand side of the regression model, in the first analysis, I only included the dummy denoting whether the municipality has a candidate with the funding scatter, zero otherwise. So uh, the slope is negative but it's not statistically significant. In the second column, I interacted this uh, dummy variable with the scandal uh, by the LDP vote share in 2021 because potentially um, LDP supporters were more unhappy with the scandal candidates. But the interaction term or the original like a dummy variable were not statistically significant. So my answer to this question again is uh, no. Now I'm moving on to my analysis on DPP. So my first question is, um, did new voters support DPP? So it's very difficult to define what who new voters are, but so this is what I'm trying to do. My hypothesis is that higher turnout in 2024 compared to 2021 is associated with higher DPP vote share in 2024 compared to 2021. So this is a simple, very correlational analysis. So, so my take is that if the change in turnout is bigger than zero, so if there are, so meaning that the, those municipalities is, is with more voters, in 2024 are defined as those municipalities with more new voters. So slope should be negative. So here is the results. It, on the horizontal axis, change in turnout is located, while on the vertical axis, change in DPV vote share was located. So here, the relationship is clearly positive. So more more turnout in 2024 is associated with more the larger vote share of DPP in 2024. So this implies that those who didn't vote in 2021 but voted in 2024 chose to vote for DPP. So DPP for some reason, not for some reason, could mobilize new group of people to support. But this relationship, this positive relationship that is not observed for other parties. Um, top left is about LDP, top right is about CDP, uh, bottom left, Kometo, bottom right, JCP. So for those two big parties at the top show no relationship between turnout and their vote share. For Kometo and for JCP, the relationship is negative, probably because they are more relying on like a, a fixed 
number of like suborders from each of the municipalities. Finally, so I would like to um, address who, what, what kind of, what type of people voted in 2024. So this is probably likely to uh, be like younger generations who chose to support for um, DBB. So my hypothesis is more younger voters is associated with higher turnout in 2024 compared to 2021. So uh, let me show you my results like this. So the top two graphs are showing the relationship between like a working age population and change in turnout. So, so the left one is population between 15 and 39, while the right one is showing the relationship between like the population from like 40 to 64 and the change in turnout. And interestingly, the relationship is um, positive. So meaning that if there are more younger people in the municipality, they showed a lot I mean, positive change in turnout. But this relationship is not observed for the population, percent of population who is older than uh, 65. And these graphs are showing the relationship between uh, the size of the young working age population and the change in DPP vote share. So municipalities with more working age population is associated with larger positive change in DPP vote share. So, um, so my my um, tentative conclusion is that turnout does not much explain the LDP's losses in this election, while DPP's gain is associ are associated with a higher turnout, younger voters. So I'm gonna do some additional analysis because I have some uh, survey data on my table. So um, we did some like a uh, large scale survey before and after the general election. The number of uh, respondents is about uh, 30,000, 20,000. So I'm going to replicate what I found using the uh, individual level data to confirm that what I've said was just plausible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have a few minutes, 15 minutes uh, for questions. Um, would anyone like to, would anyone like to kick us off? Yeah. Yeah, Fukumoto-san, would you like to go ahead? Okay, uh, I have uh, one question to Matsubaya-san. So why, why don't you study the kind of absolute vote share or partisan turnout? I think it is better than the total turnout. So uh, meaning that the uh, denominator must be the size of the electorate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not must, but that... it, it, it might it'll be better. Okay. I think I, I think I I I I, I, mean, I didn't think about it, but I I I'm a, let me try that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the talk. It's very interesting uh, data and preliminary analysis. I was just wondering, it's like, um, it might be awkward because it's not really directed to like the speakers, but like more in general, it's like I want to like ask your opinion on this, but what do you think so like the longer term like political economic consequences or like the implications of this election because uh the one of the very prominent fiscal reductionist party the Ishin Nokai was very like pre performed very badly and then most of many of the parties seem to be very happy with the current level of spending or even like like supporting like even larger spending so yeah that's my question thank you yeah would anyone like to address these long-term consequences of this um, you call I, it an earthquake call uh, <laughs> sorry i i don't know i never thought about that a anyone 
please jump in. Perhaps we can take a, a few other questions, especially because Eve may have questions related to political yeah. as well, and then we'll come back to you, um, Kenta. Okay. Because I, I think ultimately this is uh, the question that we're all interested in the long term. Eve? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for the amazing data. That was phenomenal. Um, well, so I have a, a slightly a, a question on the policy side. I'm very curious if anyone here is looking at the exit polls on the most salient issues, apart from corruption. Uh, and in particular, you know, we know that economy is always high, uh, but do we know anything about how salient foreign policy was? Because the rest of the world is looking at this election as crucial when it comes to the new defense commitment and all the new positioning of Japan. Uh, but it could be that it's just not salient at all, right? And that's the usual contrast. But I wonder, and in, in terms of saliency of policy issues. Mm -hmm. So if we're collecting, I might ask a question as well. Mm -hmm. Is that all right, yeah. no, please go ahead. Yeah. So um, it's easy to say quite a lot with the benefit of hindsight. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, I think we can say that the Japanese public were more unhappy about the money politics scandal than perhaps the party realised. And I'm curious as to what people, because, Koi, you talked about the 2005 election. So in 2005, Koizumi had these rebels that he decided to denominate because they voted against his postal privatisation plan. So he decided to denominate them and he ran people in their place. And this time, there was, I think there was even maybe the same number of people, um, 46 kind of rings a bell, but there were 46 people who were scandal tainted politicians. And this time the party could have done the same thing, right? It could have denominated them and found other candidates and ran them in the place of those people. And especially, and that, then the problem that, you know, the money, the scandal that happened, the thing that happened three days before the election where they gave all of this money to the branch chiefs, because what happened at this time, they they denominated the individuals, but they remained as branch chiefs, apart from like the, the 12 of them. And then the branch chiefs got the money from, you know, the party uh, three days before the election. So I guess my, I guess I'm interested in the comparison with 2005. Like, why didn't they go that far this time to actually find other people and run them? That's, that's my question. I guess, I, mean, I guess Ishibara is not that decisive like Ko Koizumi. He, he, like the, Ishibara's positions on so many things like wavered a lot. So I think that comes from Ishibara's personality, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, any other things. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, there was a sense that, for example, um, calling the election early would help the party. I think that's something that um, Cole mentioned as well. But I think in this case, it meant that there was a lot of scrambling that needed to happen. Um, who actually was going to be denominated was not entirely clear, um, especially early on. And of course, um, Ishiba had edged out um, uh, Takaichi, and there were broader concerns about how the Abe faction, uh, which was hit by the scandals the most, um, what their... Uh, political strategy or, or how they were going to behave during the election itself. And I, I remember Ishiba originally wanted to not have the election immediately, um, but he was pressured to do so by the party. And so I think it was a strategic failure by the party collectively um, to do this without sorting out what its actual candidate options were going to be. Um, but I, I see uh, Kenya with a question. Yeah, thanks so much. It's kind of related to that. Uh, a little bit of going back to the um, LDP election itself, and I'm thinking of the who's the loser of the LD among the LDPs. So Abe faction, as you mentioned, was the biggest loser. And then, uh, and uh, if we look at the similarity between the DPP and the Abe faction's policy, especially for Takaichi, she uh, supported the expansion, expansive physical as well as the lower the monetary policy, the monetary easing. So I would assume that the those LDP supporter who supported Sakaichi or Abenomics type of things substitute to, to the DPP. So I'm interested in if Matsubaya-san's analysis for the second one, 
you could do DID with not only for scandal, but also you could just focus on other, other factions people. So that we could see that, you know, how services, because like, you know, if you look at the globally, inflation is oh, inflation just like, you know, kill the incumbent party. So I think like, you know, um, whereas like an Ishiba kind of like, you know, really um, supported more discipline and not, a, you know, distribute to the money to the uh, people. So I think the economic policy might affect the substitution effect from the LDP losers to the DPP. So I'm interested in that. Substitution. Just looking at the chat to see if we have more questions. Yusaku has kindly shared a link with some of the data. Thank you, Yusaku. Can I ask a question? Oh, please. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, uh, I uh, well, I, I already posted, but uh, after uh, 2017 and 21, I scraped the original data from Sol Show, and then wrangled the data and then compiled the municipality level election with official election results. So I haven't done this, uh, but I will do this for the 2024. So feel free to use those municipality level data. Yeah. Now I have a question to Mr. Barista, or question, or maybe the suggestion. So I like your idea of testing uh, the impacts of scandal on turnout or vote for LDP, which is perhaps quite interesting, not just uh, to understand Japanese politics, more generally uh, political behavior compared to politics. And then you may be able to write something uh, that can be published from, uh, from a really good journal. And then, but uh, you're essentially listing like 48 LDP politicians who are commonly mentioned as Uragane Gi, right? Yeah, but uh, if you look at this, uh, the Uragane money scandal uh, issues for like since the beginning of this year, there are actually so many more, right? So nearly, uh, I, I, I just did a quick search, but I guess nearly 100 LDP politicians were mentioned at least as a potential uh, people who are, you know, quite, you know, scandalous. But uh, for some reasons, 48 are now recognized as the Uragane Gin. So you may be able to use this, this, you know, original uh, entire the list of uh, LDP politicians who are mentioned by the news media as a potential uh, you know, dirty politician as an instrument. And then you may be able to make a uh, causal inference uh, under certain assumption, of course, then based on two stage or uh, instrumental variable. So that, that I think can be done. And if you succeed, that I think can be a really interesting paper that I think you can publish from, from a good political science journal. Thank, Thank you, Olivia-san. Can I, can I um, yeah, jump please. in? Um, I, I agree with what Yusaku just said. Um, so first publish your chapter in Japan Decides and then do something more um, uh, extensive uh, as a journal article. And I wonder, I as Yusaku was talking, I was wondering if um, thinking about the, the scandals effect on the individual politicians who were um, involved versus the party and its reputation and so I wonder if you could compare the loss in um, votes or turnout in the single member district um, races. Uh, you, you may see no change in turnout, um, but the different outcomes in the single member district races for the LDP versus the PR vote uh, in the same uh, in the same district. So there's two, there's two possibilities. One is that voters who are unhappy with the scandals punish the incumbents, but they continue voting for the LDP. Uh, another option is that um, they punish the LDP uh, as well as the incumbents. Uh, so sort of the, the, the incumbent scandals bring down the party's uh, brand uh, overall. Uh, and in that scenario, um, the party's brand may be affected even outside of the districts where an incumbent tainted by the scandals is, is running. And so I wonder if you can think about that as you um, uh, further work with your data. Thanks. Um, sort of... Uh... Related to that point, um, I, one, I think it's a great way to leverage the distinctions that Yusaku made. 
about the different degrees of involvement in the scandals. Um, but you know, one thing I've been curious about is the effect, the, the late news effect of the fact that money had been sent to the party branches of those who have been denominated. Um, but I think in recent elections, the number of people who vote early or who vote absentee mm. has increased quite significantly. Um, I know it's less this time than the last election because the last election had the COVID effect on it as well. Um, but especially with the survey data that you were collecting, is it possible to distinguish time of voting, um, how early they voted, or did they vote on the day of the election, and whether or not the revelation of this later um, scandal had an effect or not? If I may, I just might jump in with another suggestion for Matsubaya Shisan. Um, I don't think that we... so. You're, you're looking at this like these places that had high support for the LDP in 2021, municipalities with very high rates of support for the LDP, you think they're going to have a bigger uh, decline in turnout relative to 2024. But I, I just this is a plug for my own research, but um, I think that the municipalities with very high rates of support for the individual LDP candidates, typically they're going to maintain their high rates of support. So I would I would say that because they're getting a lot of government resources. So I have a project that I've been working on uh, for a long time, and it just suggests that the, the municipalities with high rates of support for the individual LDP SSD candidates, they get a lot of money. They get a lot of government resources for supporting the LDP. So I think that if you're going to get a, a flow of votes away from the LDP, it's probably not going to be those really supportive places. So I, I think I, I really want to know the... Uh, I, my hunch is that the... The losses are mostly LDP supporters staying home, but I'm just I'm still thinking about your research design and how to mm -hmm. estimate that because I wouldn't expect that to be in the highly supportive places. And then just on Dan's suggestion before about looking at PR votes for the LDP, we just have to be careful because some LDP politicians ask their voters to vote Cormato in PR. So sometimes like you've got an LDP politician who's really struggling in their SSD, and if they are in a place where they're getting lots of Cormato votes, then they ask some of their supporters to vote for the Cormato in PR. So that's just something that we, we can keep in mind. Dan. Yeah, that was actually what I, what my I, my comment was going to be is that um, the LDP and Cometo in that relationship, the, the way it works is that um, LDP politicians who get support from Cometo voters in the single member, single member district races uh, ask a portion of their supporters to vote for Cometo in PR, or they give the the names uh, of their Koenkai members to Cometo and then Cometo contacts them. But they're giving them the, the names of their most diehard supporters, uh, because those are the ones who will credibly do the bidding uh, of the of the exchange relationship. And you might imagine in elections like 2024, where the LDP is at risk of losing, that vote exchange would break down. And so, if if you were looking at the PR vote for Cometo, um, you 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 might expect uh, it, it to decline, particularly where the LDP incumbent is more. Um, at risk, they don't have uh, um, the the room uh, to tell some of their supporters to vote uh, Cometo in, in PR, or the, the, those voters, um, you know, are less likely to you know uh, think that that it's uh, worth supporting Cometo when the LDP itself is at risk. Because of course, the PR vote may determine whether their favored candidate in single member districts gets a a, a safety seat or a, a zombie seat through the um, uh, through the PR list. And actually, I have run some numbers for previous elections. It looks like LDP supporters are not voting for Cometo in PR, even when they are asked to do so. So I think we have to wrap it up. But there was a question about long-term consequences, mm. and no one has really spoken to that. So I would just raise one. Um, if the income tax threshold gets raised because of the DPP's leverage over the LDP, right? So this is what they want. They want to raise this income tax threshold. So there will be a loss of tax revenue, and that's been in the news over the last week. So there'll be, there'll be a big loss of tax revenue, and that's going to have consequences, the LDP is saying. It's going to have consequences for all of the money that they make available to municipalities in Japan. So if there is, and that's sort of, it's one explanation for why the LDP is very opposed to 
the DPP's policy plans, what the what the DPP wants, because it's going to create this big this big loss of revenue, and that could have long term consequences. Because if the central government does have doesn't have enough money to send to all the municipalities and rural areas in Japan that need the money, then that could have like quite serious consequences for the party's hold on power into the future. Mm. That's one thing, one thought I have. You know, the general point, just two things. One is um, with the upper house election coming up as as Co noted at the beginning of his talk, um, ultimately any large gains that um, opposition, opposition parties are going to make are going to have to come in the rural areas as well as urban areas. So I think the points that Amy just raised is something that particularly I think the CDP is going to approach very delicately. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell how quickly DPP will try to expand its national reach um, they're popular among young people, again, as noted in today's presentation. Um, but just because you're popular once doesn't mean that you can keep that, um, especially among a younger population. And so how the opposition parties negotiate on this and whether or not um, they're willing to side with the LDP or, or I mean, it's, fight, it, it's hard to fight against a tax cut, but um, I think that's uh, something to look forward to. But it touches on the second point, um, which is, um, I've long been a contributor to Japan Decides. It's my first time on the editorial team. But most of the time, um, once the election is done, um, Japan Decides already know what it's going to work on, I think, or what the chapters are going to be. Um, but this is the first election in a while where after the election has been as exciting as the election itself. And so um, I think Dan and I and Robert are going to have to work hard on the concluding chapter and see um, where we can take this. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you so much for our three our three speakers. And for that data collection within one month, within less than one month, three weeks, it's very impressive. So uh, thank you for putting that together for us. And everybody have a good night or morning. Thank, thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.